the political divide that is hurting the nation. Washington politics are recovering from the shutdown as the White House deals with more than a handful of its own problems, while poll numbers for both sides are plummeting. Today, we're sitting down with Indiana Congressman Todd Rokita, and our political insiders look ahead one year from now at the 2014 midterm elections. Plus, we're saying goodbye to our friend Norman Cox. He's retiring after more than three decades of covering politics in Indiana. It's all coming up on this edition of Indianapolis This Week. From RTV6, Indianapolis This Week. Welcome to Indianapolis This Week. I'm Rafael Sanchez. The state of bipartisanship in our nation's capital is not good right now. The back and forth political games from both sides are not only putting the economy at risk, threatening our credit ratings, but it's also hurting the politicians who are doing it. Approval ratings are hitting all-time lows. This week, a new poll shows the president's approval rating down to 42%, while the approval rating for Republicans down 22%. And now we're facing more deadlines in a few months with more fiscal fights, possibly, and polls show that the voters, they're just getting tired of it. Uh, joining us now is Congressman Todd Rokita. He, he represents Indiana's 4th District. Mr. Rokita sits on the committees of House Administration, Budget, Education, and the Workforce. Let's talk about the Affordable Care Act. Does the president need to fire someone? And a follow-up question, should we get a refund for these websites that are not working? You know, Rafael, first of all, thanks for having me uh, back. We've worked together for a long time, and uh, for my starting from my years as Secretary of State, and uh, uh, you do a great service, not only with this show, but in your reporting overall. I would also answer your question by saying absolutely people need to be fired, but that's not going to solve the problem. Uh, the problem we have is that there, this is a law that can't that, that is very insidious okay because it's built on lies first of all the administration including the president himself knew that you could not keep your insurance plan if he wanted to yet he continued and his administration continued on saying it are you calling so, him a liar is the president a liar? The president is lying, and, and okay. according to the Federal Register, okay. uh, we knew he was lying since, two, well, he, and he should know that he was lying since 2010 okay. because his own administration said this. Okay. Okay, so this is serious stuff, and he continued this charade on for several years, and now um, chickens are coming home to roost in a very real sense. Who should we fire? Kathleen Sebelius? I mean, who, who do we fire? <laughs> I mean, right, because... Well, really, this is the people's responsibility because we not only elected this president and the administration, we re-elected him. And so I'm hopeful now, as so many of us have been saying uh, for so many years now, uh, that this law is bad, uh, that we will take matters uh, in our own hands in 2016 and elect credible people. But in the meantime, Congressman, we have a law that's on the book. So, yeah. so do we fire people? Does someone need to go? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Kathleen Sebelius should go. Others should go. We should. Uh, uh, that that website needs to be. How about a uh, refund? Because because we spent yeah. Right? Yeah. millions of dollars. Millions, hundreds of millions of dollars on this website. And let me put it in perspective. You know, we talked about our relationship going back. You reported uh, for years on the statewide voter file that we built uh, when I was Secretary of State. Now, we had good reports and we had bad reports. But at the end of the day, that system, which was responsible for over 4 million voters and getting them registered from 92 different legacy systems in the counties. Okay, not an easy feat, but it was done ultimately on time and under budget, and I think it was under three or four million dollars. So this is not hard. This is not hard stuff. So absolutely, we should get a refund. However, having experience in the architecture of and in building IT systems, I can tell you, you cannot repair this. So you have to start over. So in the interim, well, but Obamacare is not about a website. The president's right in that. Sure. So how do we then deal? How do you? Because it's your, it's you, you are the congressman. How do you then deal with the law as it exists now? Because it's here. It's on the books. So can you tinker with things? Can you move things around to improve it while you wait for 2016, Listen, as you suggest? Yeah. Yeah, well, as we wait for 2016, uh, no, we take every opportunity we can to continue to delay, uh, defund, whatever D word you want to use, repeal, we'll throw some R words in, uh, to, to stop this law because it is a deception. It is built on lies. Not only can you, can you not keep your plan if you want to in a lot of cases, in millions of cases, uh, but it's not affordable. It's going to cost everyone more, including our deficit and debt. Over the next 10 years alone, uh, we're projecting two 
two trillion dollars in extra debt. So this whole law has to go, and it has to be replaced with something a lot better. It's not okay just to say no. But Congressman, you do deficit numbers so that the deficit is coming down. So we are getting mixed signals on this, right? No, no, no. We're not getting mixed signals. The deficit is your yearly. The deficit is your yearly spend. Okay. okay. So if the deficit's coming down, all all that is saying is that uh, the deficit you thought you'd have for this year, the overspending you thought you'd have for this year, is coming down. Our debt can still be going up because we're still in deficit year over year. The debt is the sum of all the deficits of this country sure. uh, that, that's had year over year. I, I just wish personally that Washington would use the math that my wife and I use when we look at our checkbook, yeah. which makes sense. Washington math never makes sense. Let's talk about the budget. Will there be another, will we have a government shutdown? Will, will we have a debt ceiling crisis again? Are we going to see this drama unfold again in 2014? You know, I, I'm, 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 I'm afraid you may. Uh, we're working very hard, and I would take, uh, not exception, because I understand what you're saying at the int introduction of this, and I understand people are frustrated, but you got to also understand, we're not, at least this congressman, is not playing political games here. I came to reduce the deficits, to reduce our overall debt. We are the first generation in the history of America, Raphael that's going to leave the next one worse off by any objective measure. And so there's a real serious fight going on, and it's about this. Will we as a culture, will we as a generation decide to live within our means, or will we take from the next one? from people who don't yet exist, who are being taxed in effect and have no representation because they're not here yet. Um, that's really the question. There's a huge fight going on. So what would I, could, I would argue that bipartisanship to date, to the extent we've had it, and you called for bipartisanship at the beginning of this show, has gotten us this debt has gotten us $17 trillion in debt. Because what happens, and I've seen it for three years now, is you'll say you're a Republican and I'm a Democrat and I want this and you want that. Well, we come together in a bill and when it comes time to paying for it, we both agree, well, we're not going to pay for it because that would hurt our constituencies maybe or that would cause us political risk. We're going to let the children of tomorrow pay for it. And then we're going to hold hands and we're going to say we're bipartisan. That has got us into this mess. And until we have this fight out. But you have to work together, don't you? I mean, someone no, has to. Of course to. we have to work together. So, but of course so then we do. how do you get... How do you get anything done then if you can't say we first we first have you to take and I give we we have to recognize that Washington doesn't have a revenue problem it has a spending problem we take what is in effect 20 percent of the value of our gross domestic product every year just to run the federal government and of that 40 percent is borrowed on the next generation we have enough revenue to do absolutely everything we want and two times more well. What we what we have what the problem we have is a spending problem. So as soon as the parties can recognize that, and there's big government Republicans too, and I see it every day as well. But as soon as we re recognize that we have to have a smaller government, which Obamacare is the opposite of, uh, then we can really lock hands together and work together. But the, we're just too far apart, and we need the American people. We need your viewers to decide what kind of government they want. And we want you to come back to continue this discussion. Cause is it over long. already? It is over. It is over. Stay. Congressman uh, Todd Rokita, 4th District of Indiana, we thank you for coming. Please come back again. Stay beautiful. Thank you. I prefer handsome. That thank too. You. After the break, our political insiders and the outlook for the midterm elections. And joining us now, two of our political insiders, Republican Jennifer Hollowell and Democrat Laura Beck. We just heard from Congressman Todd Rokita as the country prepares for another discussion over the budget. He says it's possible that we could be looking at another government shutdown if there's not enough negotiations on both sides. Is it possible that we're going to see this one more time? Well, it, what was really interesting is the hardline Tea Party uh, extremist attack that, uh, con that Congressman Rikita appears to be taking. Um, and it's almost like he's just talking off of the Heritage Foundation's talking points, which, you know, sometimes you see him regurgitate along the way. Is it, is it Tea Party or is it the fact that he's coming from a heavily Republican district and is standing up for the principles from his district that he can get away with saying, I don't have to compromise. My voters will get me back in office in 2014. I, I mean, I think it's representative of um, uh, many Hoosiers who are either Republican or who are fiscally conservative and, frankly, who prioritize, you know, lower spending and limited government. And, you know, the things he was talking about all drive to that. A majority of Hoosiers oppose Obamacare. A majority of Hoosiers um, prefer lower spending. And, you know, the congressman made some excellent points about we have to start making some tough choices and come together and find compromise so that we can, you know, reduce our country's debt and what we're leaving to Laura, future generations. But Laura, is he in a safe district? Can he get away with saying, 
uh, saying that the president isn't telling the truth because he knows I, good yeah, and well that I, maybe his voters will send him back? I think when you, I think when we talk about, especially those Republicans um, from Indiana who, who were so much in favor of the shutdown and of those activities and were very out there, such as um, Congressman Stutzman as well, um, because of the way those districts are drawn, um, they are drawn to favor Republicans. And so until we see some movement at the state legislative level, we may not see change. However, the way that the arguments are shaping, we've got you know another fiscal uh, fight looming here, as we as we talked about. We've got gay marriage uh, coming up next year, potentially on the ballot. We could see the pendulum shift back uh, as we look ahead to 2014. Is it likely? Possibly. Is it going to happen? It may not, but it still means that Democrats, we've got to put up credible candidates. Perfect segue. Monday marks one year to the day that we go to the 2014 elections. Um, how is that shaping? And will the votes that the Republicans and the Democrat took uh, for the government shutdown or to keep the government open, will, will that come back to bite anyone uh, when it comes time for the voters to decide? I don't think you'll see a big impact. Um, and it's also important to remember that, you know, time is really different in politics. And a year mm -hmm. is a long, long time. A lot of different things can happen. And we've seen races change over the matter of a couple weeks, over the matter of a day. And um, so I don't think they're going to have an impact. And also, I mean, somewhat to Lara's point, I mean, our congressmen are representing their districts. And, you know, they were sent to Washington just in the last couple of cycles with a pretty clear message from their voters about Obamacare and about, you know, government spending being out of control. So I don't think that, that we'll see a big impact from that. Uh, certainly not in a negative way. Do Democrats what? pick up any seats, or do they stay with the seats that they have now? Or do Republicans take over? I think one of the real wild cards is the gay marriage amendment. Um, if that goes on the ballot, which uh, the uh, Republican Howard County chairman uh, had a column that he wrote about how this could bring out younger voters who will likely vote Democrat as well, um, because they are th th that that type of discrimination um, against same-sex couples is is not something that they're comfortable with. So this will bring them out to vote um, and he said that will also make them likely to vote in the Democrat category so if you think about that and that wild card that's out there uh, he referred to members of his party as lemmings off a cliff is that true? At this I mean, moment. Is, it, is it a game changer or will Hoosiers just still vote the way they want to vote and, and not make it an issue well, I mean, I think they're, I think they're very, very different things. You know, you've got a constitutional amendment about an issue, and then you've got candidates and representatives who, you know, voters know and, and are familiar with and different positions. But I'd also say that we do have a long time to go. Um, before anything gets on the ballot, it's going to have to pass through the legislature. There's a lot of debate going on right now, and I suspect we'll see the debate heat up over the next few months um, as it hits the legislature. And, you know, and I don't know that you can make any prediction like that. Um, you know, building a, a turnout model as we would do in politics is a challenging thing, and this certainly would make it different. I don't dispute that. The debate is raging when it comes to signing up for the Affordable Health Care Act. It has been a challenge. That website is not working. And I asked the congressman this question: Does he need to? Does the president need to fire? someone or many people and do taxpayers deserve a refund for the poor work that was done not being able to get that website to work well one of the things that congressman uh, rakita talked about and you know how he's built it systems and things like that those it systems that he was building um at some point in time in his career obviously were probably fully funded um unfortunately uh, republicans really held back congressional republicans on appropriating that um, but that's no excuse three years and but five hundred million no dollars wasn't that's, enough to but that's no excuse. website that launched it's no excuse Yes, the website, it, let me finish my point, the website is clunky, it's clumsy, yes, there, but Kathleen, uh, I'm sorry, uh, the, the Health and Human Secretary, Health and Human Services Secretary has gone to Capitol Hill, she's apologized, she's pledged to fix it. Uh, should she be fired? Should someone in her administration be fired? Probably, but the political logistics with the gridlock in Washington of trying to get somebody approved right now as a new secretary, I think would be beyond challenging. You get the last the website's seconds. more than clunky, it's an absolute failure, and the millions of dollars that went into it, um, you know, prove that. And yes, people should be fired. If you look at the notes from the contractor, they admit that this condensed time frame was not going to allow for proper testing of a website. I mean, anyone who's who's unveiled a website of any size knows that you have to test it first. But the Republicans also shut the government down the night before opening and enrollment. And this debate will continue. Testing. The one thing that we can all agree on, of course, is that our colleague Norman Cox is retiring, so I'm sure we're going to wish him well, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. We're going to miss you, Norman. Good luck. And you can follow these great insiders every week on the IndyChannel.com. Indianapolis' week continues right after the break. 
After more than three decades of serving the people of Indiana as our political reporter, Norman Cox is retiring. Leaders and friends Norman has worked with over the years have some special messages for him as he steps away. Take a look. Norman, uh, for you and your family, uh, from my family, on behalf of all the people of central Indiana, let me extend to you our heartfelt thanks for the service that you've provided in the fourth estate to the people of Indiana. Well, Norm, my congratulations to you. Uh, you probably know more about Indiana government over the years than anybody else, and uh, you'll, you will clearly be missed. On the other hand, uh, it was always a pleasure to be able to be interviewed by you. Uh, you went after the facts, um, but you did it in a way uh, that was civil. And it was always a pleasure to talk to you, to learn from you, uh, to be able to communicate through you. So I wish you the very best as you go forward to the next chapter of your life. It's been a pleasure associating with you over these years. Hey, Norm, Luke Messer here. I want to congratulate you on 36 years of television at RTV6. You spent decades covering legislative issues important to Hoosiers and broke major stories that shaped Indiana's history, all the while doing it with integrity, your unique dry sense of humor, and with the utmost professionalism. All the best in your retirement. I hope you take some time for well-deserved rest and relaxation. Congratulations, Norm. You've made it to the finish line. That's an increasingly rare feat in this business. It's because you found a niche. Don't believe anyone who tells you it was a rut. Covering the State House is hard work. And sure, it requires an occasional nap, but that's okay. You were there when I arrived, and for those who don't know, that was almost 31 years ago. You've lived through the heyday of local television news and come out the other side. And where does that lead? Cleveland. I have just one question. If you move someplace where you fit in, how will you stand out? Norm, I just want to say congratulations. I know you've been looking forward to this day for a long, long time. I've known you for over 20 years now, and it seems to me that you've been talking about this retirement for... 20 years now. So I know you're looking forward to it. But I want to also say you deserve some real congratulations, a hearty congratulations for the job that you've done over these years. As a reporter, it's not easy. You're out in the cold, you're out in the rain, you're asking those uncomfortable questions. You're actually making a life, a career, about informing people and making their lives better. Well, you've done a good job, Norm. You've earned this retirement. And you've been talking about it for so long. Get going. Good luck, Norm. You know, Norman, it really is hard to believe that uh, uh, you've been at this uh, for more than 35 years. But Indiana's been better for it. From the first time you and I met back in the 1980s, uh, I found you to be fair, tough, well-prepared, and objective. And I can offer no better compliment to a political journalist. The work you've done near for these nearly four decades in Indiana has made our political debate richer and our public better informed. Norman Cox has actually covered seven Indiana governors, and I'm just one of them. But on behalf of all of those you've covered in the governor's office, in the legislature, and in public life, more importantly, on behalf of your viewers and the people that have benefited by your integrity and your work ethic, uh, Karen and I wish you the best retirement possible. May you and Kathy truly enjoy your time off, and may you come back to Indiana often, where you will always have grateful Hoosiers and many fans and friends. It's really hard to imagine an Indiana State House without Norm Cox around, but from the outset of his lengthy career, he established a really strong reputation. I know I found very favorable references to Norm's coverage in the papers of the first governor he covered. Oliver Morton thought very highly of Norm. I learned along the way that among Norm's interests uh, were the Star Wars series and um, you know, that must have been a, a lot of help to him. I know that the uh, uh, Indiana House of Representatives and the Star Wars bar scene uh, had an awful lot in common, and Norm must have felt right at home covering those proceedings. In seriousness just this once, Norm, I want to tell you, and I mean every word of this, I did not meet in any of the arenas in which I uh, had the opportunity to participate in public life a straighter, uh, more knowledgeable, more fair, tough-minded, but objective reporter than I met in you. And it'll be a loss when you are no longer a part of the family of Indiana journalism. Congratulations on a really solid career. 
best of luck in every respect except a high state athletics. Norman, on behalf of all of your colleagues, thank you for your decades of work and service to the people of Central Indiana. You will be missed. You're watching Indianapolis This Week. I'm Jane Hindman, and here's what's making headlines right now. Jurors are expected to begin deliberating tomorrow in the trial of a suspended Metro police officer accused of causing a deadly crash while intoxicated. RTV6's Katie Hines joins us on the city's northeast side with details. Shade, we're near 56th and Brendan Way. This is where that deadly crash happened just three years ago. A judge is expected to hand the jury the case tomorrow after lawyers for both sides deliver closing arguments. Jurors will consider testimony from 75 witnesses and evidence from close to 300 exhibits during the course of the three-week trial. Suspended Metro Police Officer David Bessard is acute of, accused of driving under the influence in August 2010 and causing that deadly crash. Reporting live on the city's northeast side, Katie Hines, RTV6. Katie, thanks. We'll leave you with a look at Monument Circle. We'll be back with more news and weather during Good Morning America. You help pay for the Broad Ripple parking garage, but the Call 6 investigators uncovered problems which are leading to immediate results. The city of Indianapolis shelled out $6.4 million to help build the garage, but they won't tell us how many people are parking there. So the Call 6 team did their own test to find out, and the answers are eye-opening. Plus, construction crews in a brand new facility? Find out why the garage's owners took immediate action on our story Monday at 11. It's a good one. That's it for this edition of Indianapolis This Week. I'm Rafael Sanchez. Thank you for joining us, and have a great Sunday.